the start broadcast button on the go. I want to thank everybody for jumping on the call uh, at the earlier hour. We have um, a pretty extensive agenda today. Um, we may need to, to move a few things around. Considering we do have some planned executive committee calls um, kind of out of sequence between now and the annual meeting, I think we can uh, move a few, uh, a few items around. Um, I'm not gonna go through any housekeepings because I assume you all know where your own bathrooms are and where your refrigerators are if you need a, need a cold drink during the conversation. So I'll dispense with that. Um, Where's because, breakfast? Yeah, yeah, get some, get you, you have to get your own breakfast too. Um, and uh, as far as um, the agenda, uh, do we have any additional items or new business that need to be brought up before the board? I have a few items, but I'll uh, do a call out first. Does anybody have any items that they would like to bring? Just feel free to speak up if you do. Hearing none. Um, we do have um, the board should have, all members of the board should have received a letter from Tom Fody. Um, so we're going to put that under new business. Um, that'll be a very quick item for this meeting. Um, um, Bob Spud and I have had some preliminary conversations around the virtual annual meeting coming up, uh, whether it should be virtual, um, and, and um, we need to add that to the list. And then um, uh, the conducting of public hearings, obviously based on straight bass and other things that we have coming up, there will be public hearings associated with amendments and addendums. So um, we need to talk about how those things are gonna work. That may be a bigger topic, uh, which will take some time. So, um, you know, that may be something we just raise at this meeting and then uh, continue it in one of our future calls. So does, does anybody have any objections to any of those things being added? Hearing no objections, what I would like to do, um, actually, uh, is there any member of the public that has uh, anything that they would like to raise that is not on the agenda? Not seeing any hands or hearing, uh, not seeing any hands, I guess I wouldn't hear them because I'd be muted. Um, uh, we'll continue to move on then, thank you. So I, what I'd like to do is um, go out of order uh, and take item number five um, up first, um, and that's Kelly Dennett. So Kelly has joined us um, and to be able to address any questions that we might have or to, um, uh, to bring any updates that she might have. But, uh, but before that, I'm gonna turn it over to Bob Beal. I thought I was turning it over to Bob Beal. Did we have everybody but Bob? All right, sorry, the uh, organizer muted me. Not sure who that is, but that was good. Um, Thanks, Pat. Yeah, I don't have a whole lot to update on where things stand right now. You know, um, the good news for two states is, uh, and those states are Massachusetts and South Carolina, is their plans have been um, approved all the way through the process and they are ready to start working with their uh, constituents and determining what the, the payments will be. So they've gone all the way through the grants online step and they're all set. So that's pretty pretty good and, and you know it's great to see that we're we're able to make progress and get those states moving along um, a few other states Maine Rhode Island Virginia North Carolina and Georgia have all submitted initial plans and they're at various stages of review by NOAA fisheries and the preliminary re review and that sort of thing so we're moving a number of the others along it sounds like I think I've talked to most states and it sounds like everybody's moving along as best they can um, I don't I don't know if Pennsylvania is on. They're the one state I haven't talked to recently about their progress, but I know they've been working with other agencies to determine uh, who the processors are and other folks in their state that will need some assistance. So, um, <clears throat> you know, there a few questions were submitted to me prior to this call, and I have forwarded those to Kelly. But I think, you know, Pat, the value of this session is Kelly's here and the states that are still working through their processes. Um, you know, we can, Kelly's obviously the best resource to answer those questions. And 
you know, as, as we're sort of looking even longer term, as everyone knows, I think Congress is negotiating the next round of assistance through the HEALS Act. Um, and, you know, one version has $500 million for fisheries assistance in there. Um, they have taken some of the recommendations to heart that ASMFC made in the letter that we provided about a month ago to congressional leadership. So, um, you know, there are some pieces of that new legislation that may tweak the way the formula that, that allocates money to the states is administered and those sorts of things. So, you know, there may be more money coming along behind this. Um, for those of you that have submitted plans, you know this, but the others that don't, um, as part of the review, NOAA is suggesting that a sentence or two be added that says, basically the spend plan you're developing now can be used for future allocation should more money become available. So that language will essentially short circuit the next round of spend plans. In other words, we may not, depending on what, what the language from Congress looks like, if there is more money, uh, we may not have to go through the spend plan process as rigorous as it is now or, or even at all potentially. So, you know, we're, we're kind of, Kelly and, and her folks have you know, provided good advice there and, and may be able to speed up the next round quite a bit. So, you know, that, I think that's my introduction, Pat. We're, we're working through it and we're here to help any way we can with the states. And once we get proposals, we'll, we'll forward them along to the NOAA fisheries folks as quickly as possible. Um, so it's probably best to, to use Kelly's time here to answer, have her uh, answer questions from the states. Great, thanks, Bob. Um, Kelly, since you've got uh, a few questions already submitted to you, I'll just turn the uh, microphone over to you. Great, thanks, Chair, um, and thanks, Bob. Yeah, um, <clears throat> so just to follow up on Bob's last point, um, that suggested language that we're providing is totally optional. We understand um, that some states may want to choose to use a different approach if there is additional funds provided. Um, but if you don't, or if you're not sure, we're definitely suggesting that you include it um, so that it is an option that is available should more money be appropriated by Congress. Um, so the three questions that I got from Bob, uh, the first uh, was related to the sample affidavit and questions around uh, whether if folks are applying, whether they have to self-certify that they're not debarred, not on the government do not pay list and in good st standing with the federal and state government. Um, so yes, we do need you to include something uh, along those lines. It doesn't have to be those exact words. Uh, on the West Coast, they adapted the affidavit to kind of turn those words into a little bit more plain, la plain language. Um, and so we could provide that uh, to Bob uh, if you uh, aren't able to grab it from Randy. Bob, just let us know. Um, but we do need that. That's essentially, you know, we, we can't be giving assistance to folks who haven't paid child support, et cetera, et cetera. So we do need that in there. It doesn't have to be those exact words that you got in the sample affidavit. Um, and we can provide some alternatives uh, if you're interested. Just let me know. Uh, the second question was around um, this making yourself more than whole, um, especially if you're getting aid from other uh, parts of the CARES Act. Uh, so the specific reference was to some comments in Massachusetts spend plan. Um, and the first was the more than whole is evaluated on an annual basis. So this was just to make it explicit that when uh, a person is evaluating whether they're quote unquote being made more than whole, that should be in comparison to their average annual revenue. And then the second question was uh, the addition of any traditional revenue. So the point here is between traditional revenue, right, because at least in the commercial sector, some folks are going out fishing. So between your traditional revenue, Section 12005 assistance, and any other assistance you're getting under the CARES Act, whether it's PPP um, or any of the other programs, you cannot receive more assistance than your average annual revenue. And that's what we're trying to make clear with those wording suggestions. Uh, and then that segues into the third question that Bob shared, which is how do we handle the PPP uh, and EIDLs uh, where it's not clear yet whether those are going to be forgiven or not. Uh, and we totally understand this is a, a real challenge. It's come up with multiple states. Um, the short answer uh, is that the PPP um, and those uh, other assistant programs should not be considered as part of determining whether someone qualifies for the 35% revenue loss. 
Um, so in, for the 35% revenue loss, you're just looking at their traditional revenue that they're getting. And if they were part of the recent USDA purchase of any fish products, that's considered traditional revenue. Then, as I just described, in making themselves more than whole, um, obviously at this point we don't know what's going to happen necessarily with the PPP and others, um, but we're kind of advising people to assume that those are going to be forgiven um, and therefore all of that assistance collectively, including your and plus your traditional revenue, should not make you more than whole. And those are the three questions. I'm happy to answer any follow-ups. Uh, clarify anything I just said. Yeah, thanks, Kelly. Do we have any questions for Kelly? Um, while I'm waiting for hands to go up, Kelly, I, can you just clarify, because it sound, I, I thought I heard you say that PPP and other assistance programs would not be considered in as part of their loss or, or, or to make them more than whole, they shouldn't consider it. But then, then I thought you contradicted yourself to say that they may be forgiven. So the PPP um, should not be included in the calculation for the 35% revenue loss. Okay. It should be included in the making yourself more than whole determination. Okay, thank you. Uh, Clearly. I got a bunch of uh, I got a bunch of hands up. I'm going to start with uh, Jim Gilmore. Hey Kelly, how you doing? Um, just a quick question, if you can elaborate a little bit on, and I know this is uh, down the road, but the audit process, because we're getting a lot of questions from our legal staff about um, about that. So, is you um, any any detail about how that's going to work? Um, I don't, Jim. I've not been a part of any previous audits. Um, I do anticipate that. Um, one or both of either the GAO, the Government Accountability Office, or the Office of Inspector General for the Department of Commerce is going to audit our records. Um, I think the big point here is to make sure that you have the documentation to support the choices that we're making um, as part of this process, and that includes the copies of the affidavit. And uh, I think as we've talked about previously, making sure that individual fishermen um, or businesses understand that by signing that affidavit, they're affirming that they're going to have, you know, the records for, I forget what it is, three years um, to confirm that they, in fact, had whatever revenue loss they're self-certifying um, that they had. Um, I, again, my understanding, so take it with a grain of salt, um, is that most of the auditing will happen at the commission uh, level, um, but that there will be uh, most likely requests down into the into the states um, to provide information on the processes that you used, any records that you have. Um, so I'm anticipating it's going to be a bit more of a spot check uh, type of approach as opposed to 100% of everything being being audited. Um, but I don't know that for sure. Thanks. Great. Thanks, Dan McKernan. Yeah. No, thank you. Um, uh, Kelly, and, and thanks to uh, you and the, and the staff and ASMFC for processing our, our application so quickly. Um, I guess I have a question, but it's more of a comment. I just want to give you some feedback. Um, as we're sending out the, the, the draft application to our working groups, um, the largest working group that we had, which is our commercial fishing uh, group, um, we got some pushback. Uh, and the comment went like this, that in the declaration of or the affidavit uh, where you have to declare your average revenues over the last five years compared to this year's, uh, it was pointed out that uh, if, if a fisherman has to go to his accountant, the amount of uh, money the accountant's going to cost may exceed the payment. And they just fe felt that, um, that it may discourage people from applying um, given the, the challenges of having to uh, recover um, uh, all the records going back over the last five years. But it sounds like that is a, a pretty firm um, standard that uh, that the fishermen should be adhering to based on your previous comment. Yeah, and I'm sorry. Okay. Nope, yeah. that's all right. I just wanted to give you that feedback though. No, nope, I appreciate that. Yep. We'll okay. see what Congress that will hopefully help. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thanks, Dan. Jason McNamee. Thank you, Mr. Chair. 
Um, and thank you very much, Kelly. Um, I think all three of those questions originated from the great state of Rhode Island. So I really appreciate the feedback. Um, so I, I still have some questions uh, and I'll start with number, the, the second question there. Um, so maybe I'll kind of approach it this way. And, and that is in our process, what we decided to do was hone in a, on a March through May time period. Um, so that's what kind of threw us off with the, you know, the, um, the uh, evaluating on an annual basis. So the all of our evaluation, we are using, you know, the preceding five years, but we're kind of looking at a succinct period of time in the historical period, as well as in 2020. Um, so I, I guess maybe the question I'm asking is, is does that fall in line with the way you've um, kind of answered that question? So from my perspective, yes, because what you're talking about is the time period you're going to use to determine the 35% loss. So you're going to say March to May 2020 versus average March to May 2015 to 2019, which is totally fine. Um, then that determines the 35% loss and however you're structured your spend plan, how much money they're going to get. Then on the back end, um, in terms of the amount of assistance that they get, that amount of assistance plus PPP plus traditional revenue cannot be more than their average annual income from the last five years. So they're not mutually exclusive. Hopefully that makes it clear. Okay, yeah, it does. Thank you for that. Um, and then the other one, it, you are pretty clear on this, but I just want to make sure I'm completely understanding. Um, and so that was question number three. Uh, this was a super hot topic. It was basically the only thing people wanted to talk about more or less uh, during our process. But um, so this is on the PPP loans in particular. Um, it, it's just a matter of, I may be even pleading my case at this point, but it, it's a matter of timing of both of these things. And so, you know, by the time our application process for this uh, relief happens, I, I think the, the updated PPP process might just be closing. So long story short, nobody is gonna know whether or not their loans are forgiven. In our process, we've still asked them to report it. Um, but so I understood you to say, it doesn't come into play when you're judging the loss criteria, and that's clear. Um, but then, I, I just to use the phrase they used on the back end, they are still supposed to, in their claim, deduct that money from their, so that their claimed loss is the net value of their loss minus what they received in PPP, is, is that correct? Not quite, I don't think. So, um, so the PPP should not be part of the determination for the 35%, I think we got that. So then on the calculation for the more than whole, um, which I don't know how your spend plan is, is structured if you're, if you're tiering things or anything like that, but, but regardless actually, that doesn't matter because um, that would just be looking at the revenue loss. Then where the PPP comes into play is on this more than whole question and they should account for the PPP and we're suggesting that they assume that it's going to be forgiven, right? Because that would be the maximum amount that they potentially then would be receiving in assistance. Um, and so that they can't make themselves more than whole between their traditional revenue, the PPP and the 12005 assistance, that those three pockets together or those three buckets together cannot total more than their average annual revenue. If it ends up that they are, you know, that the PPP isn't forgiven, then that becomes irrelevant on that back part, right? Because now they're having to pay that back. So now it's not, it's not quote unquote assistance. 
because they're paying it back. Does that help make make that clearer? Yeah, and I, I think the the most important part, uh, you know, from the way we've been talking about it is that part gets back to question two, where we can look at that over the whole year. Um, so I think that kind of frames it up in a kind of a different context. So that's that's good. Um, thank you for that. Problem. Thanks, Jason. Uh, Sharif Patterson. Good morning. How are you? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Boy, Kelly, I wish I had I had understood this um, before Monday night because we've been meeting with the industry over the last uh, two nights for our second round of meetings, and um, they we led them to believe that um, we can't make them more than whole during the time frame that they are indicating um, that they want to be uh, considered for the assistance. So what if um, parts of these industries uh, start picking up towards um, the end of the year or say even September, October, and they start making more money, how how can they predict or looking forward to understanding whether they're going to be made more than whole if all of a sudden they're able to start making money again? I'm not saying that it would happen, but um, I know some of these people are becoming very entrepreneurial and it, it very well could happen. Yeah, how, I agree that. How do you how do you tell them that um, you know these funds you can't project forward with, but yet you're telling them that they have to project their uh, income in the future? It's just kind of a, a conflict, not only for them, but it's going to be a conflict for all of us. Yeah, no, it's a very real challenge, um, and we've been talking through that in particular um, on the West Coast and in the North Pacific where you have a lot of cap share programs where theoretically folks um, could shift their fishing to later in the year, um, assuming that uh, they might be able to pick up some um, additional revenue and or get out and, and actually have some markets later in the year. Um, and we're doing the best we can. Um, that th Those are the requirements. Um, that they and and so yes, we are asking folks to try to estimate what they think they might make um, at the end of the day, meaning the end of the year, um, and whether that combination of traditional revenue, um, the 12005 aid, and any other assistance under the CARES Act, whether it be PPP or otherwise, um, not total more than their average revenue. Um, generally speaking, uh, because the pot of funds um, as nice as it was to get help from Congress, um, you know, the payments from looking at spend plans, et cetera, did not look like they were going to be very much in the grand scheme of things for folks. Um, we were considering the risk to be minimal that someone was going to be over, but certainly there are going to be potential instances where that's the case. Um, and I don't have a better answer for you um, other than, you know, we got to ask them to, to do the best they can. May I follow up, please, Pat? Yeah, go ahead, Trude. Thank you. Um, so how is the HEROES Act um, being formulated? Because that could also, is that um, criteria following through with the HEROES Act also? Because I could see people really struggling with trying to figure out whether they're going to be um, able to take advantage of both of these pots of money without having an accountant um, guiding them day by day on whether they're going to be um, giving money back to the government. You know, the, these funds, and, and I'm not blaming you, don't, you know, don't, don't take this to heart, Kelly. <laughs> no, I, I, I totally understand. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they, they've, um, they're trying to navigate this um, without losing their businesses also, and yet 
um, and being provided these funds is something that may come back to the government if IRS or these audits all of a sudden determine that people have been made more than whole. Worst case scenario, I understand. Um, and then the money goes back to where, as opposed to back to some aspects of the fisheries where the funds was intended to go. You know, I, I'm just, ooh, I'm just hearing um, the screaming in my ears already from the fishing industry. Thank you, Kelly. No problem, Shree. And yes, we totally understand um, it's going to be uh, it's going to be challenging. Um, and to answer your uh, question there at the beginning, I don't I don't know what's going to happen between the Heroes Act and the Heels Act. Um, you know, I'm watching the news like all the rest of you to see whether Congress is actually going to get something through. The amount of funds that is in the respective bills is, varies widely. Um, so I have I just have no idea how, you know how much more we get. I think there was 100 million in the Heroes Act and 500 million in the Heels Act. So you know I don't know where things are going to fall. And once you're splitting that out, um, as we saw with the 300 million, um, it's I, I I just don't know. Um, and I don't know what direction Congress is going to give us in terms of how they might try to change the allocation of the funds. So right now I I don't have any good answers. Kelly, I can't believe you don't have a crystal ball that tells you what Congress is going to do. <laughs> um, uh, thank you for those questions, Sheree. Those are issues um, in particular that um, have raised some uh, concerns and I'm sure some eyebrows are on the board here as we're trying to figure this out. Um, I have Doug Haymans, uh, Bill Anderson, and then I'm going to go to other commissioners and I have Dave Borden on the list. So, Doug? You're muted, Doug. My apologies. That little red button is important, isn't it? Uh, just, just, it. Following up, just following up on Cherise, I guess the way I would view it, the way I would maybe direct our fishermen, if the government is really interested in, in future earnings, then that needs to be on, a, on, on the tax statement at the end of the year. I don't see how in the world we can expect any fisherman to, to forecast their future earnings as opposed to um, to claiming it all at the end of the year on their taxes, and maybe that's how the government reconciles this. But we're we're going to proceed with with the way that Jason McMay was discussing with, um, and thank you to Kelly for for a quick turnaround and stuff. But with the three months compared to the same period over the five years, and their future earnings is up to them and the government in the end, I guess. Okay, thanks, thanks, Doug. No, no real question in there. But uh, Kelly, do you have a comment on any of that? Nope. I think you covered it. Okay, great. Uh, Bill Anderson. Thank you, Pat. I appreciate it. And uh, Kelly, good morning. I've got three that are hopefully very quick for you. Um, specifically related. First one specifically related to owing money to the feds or the state. Years ago, in a different life, I, I was involved in something similar to this on the income in the income tax world, and same deal that that folks who owed money were not allowed to receive relief. But there was a second step, and that was if those people owed money, the payer was responsible to collect that money and send it back to the, the either the federal or state treasury to pay down on that debt. I assuming I assume we're not we're not going to be required to do that, but um, I just wanted to make sure we're not so that we don't end up the states having a bill to have to pay at the end of all this. So let me double check on that one for you. I believe you are correct, um, but let me double check. Appreciate it. Thank you. I, I would assume it's not in the law, so I would assume that's not required, but if we get whipsawed on this, it'll, it'll, it'll hurt. Um, second item. Um, we have a, a decent number of folks who are relatively new to our fishery. I guess the economy got some young folks interested in getting involved. Uh, we were contemplating that, for example, if somebody were in the fishery for, let's say, three years, we used the three-year average of earnings. But we've got some people that are very, very new. 
I assume the answer is because they can't, it would be impossible for them to calculate um, uh, income from the past that they're just out of luck. They're not going to be allowed to get anything. Is that is that right? So it's up, up to each state to determine that. Um, we've set a floor that the business has to have been around for at least one year. Um, okay. And then the state determine what you want to do for those who have been around for less than five. Um, most uh, states in the spend plans that we've seen from across the country um, are usually using two years or three years um, for businesses that have been around less than five. Um, but okay. you have that so you, are potentially eligible as long as they've been around for more than one year, but it's up to you as the state to determine that. Okay, so we can ratchet it all the way down to one year. So, so true new entrants are out of luck but we could ratchet it down to one year and use one year's income or revenue to, to, to uh, determine a loss. Correct. Great, thanks. And then one final question. Um, we are contemplating having an option in our um, uh, plan that would, that would carve some money away for projects um, to, to, to benefit the fishery. Um, but in our experience in the past, the, the administrative load to do that, the rules, NEPA rules and other record keeping rules for the small amount of money that Maryland's getting, $4 million, the piece we would carve out for projects, the cost would be so onerous that probably most of the money would go to, to, do the, to maintain the, or, or, or take care of the administrative costs. Is there any thought of lightening those requirements up so we can actually push more money into the projects or is it the standard the standard approach is what we've got to do so you kind of just suck it up suck it up and do it if you want to do project yeah i would say it's more the latter bill um you know if you're talking about potentially doing habitat restoration or some other types of work that are going to potentially require other permitting and nepa um th those requirements still exist right okay great i appreciate it kelly sorry for taking so much time pat no, those are good questions, Bill. Thank you. Uh, next on the list is Steve Murphy. Yeah, thank you, Kelly, and congratulations on your promotion. Um, so I'm trying to wrap my head around several of the previous just uh, questions here. It, it almost sounds like states would be better off to wait until the start of 2021 because then the fishermen could verify their annual earnings which are used in the can't make yourself whole calculation with the potential payback um, issue. Um, I, I agree, I think this adds a level of complexity that we're gonna really have to think about course I think politically we're not going to be given that option uh, so um, it, not really a question just a just a comment to see if others are maybe thinking the same way that's all I got thank you mr. chair yeah yeah thank you Steve I think um, it's, it's making me scratch my head a little bit I gotta I gotta ponder this one um, to make some determinations because we're using a very we're using a discrete time frame for lobster, for instance, and then if we have to then, I think it's gonna to have to be making a statement to say people are gonna to have to make the potentially self-determine whether they think they're gonna be um, out of that 35% loss bracket. Um, anyway, uh, Jason McMahon, your hand is still up, but do you, do you have a follow-up? No, sorry about that, putting it down. Okay, that, thank you. Um, Dave Borden. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Um, quick question. Kelly, did the, do the funds that individuals collect from a state agency count in the calculation to uh, determine whether or not someone is being made whole? And then I've got a short follow-up. You're talking about like state unemployment or um, state assistance kind of a thing, Dave? That's correct. I believe the answer to that to be yes, it would count in the more than whole calculation, um, but let me double check. Well, it, I just make the observation that, that if, it, if it counts uh, and, and then at the end of the period, fishermen have to pay back money, 
uh, it's going to be really problematic, I think, for state agencies. And the related uh, point uh, is on it's kind of a follow up to Steve's question is if, I mean, the way, now I, I keep in mind I work for the fishing industry at this point. Uh, fishermen are going to get these checks, whatever the amount is, and they got to spend them. Uh, and then if they have to pay back money at the end of the year, uh, they're not going to have the funds to do it uh, because it's already going to be spent. And it's going to be a second wave of disasters for, you're going to get all kinds of complaints uh, uh, about the system at that point. So if there's some way to avoid that, I urge you guys to try to focus on that and avoid the payback. Uh, provision. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dave. Um, Mel Bell. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Yeah, to, to Steve's point earlier about you know waiting to 2021, that that makes sense. Now trying to deal with this um, more than whole for the entire year, but the. My understanding from the beginning on this, and one reason we were trying to move fairly quickly, was that we were trying to get money into the hands of uh, fishermen and, and dealers and all that that were were hurting right now. And the the whole uh, uh, you know benefit of the way we were doing this, and it being a little different from the normal disaster type process we follow, which were sometimes you know, they don't see anything from that for years and years. Uh, you know, so we were trying to do this in a expeditious manner. And, and now uh, it's a little scary, uh, again, you know, asking people to project, uh, you know, <laughs> for the entire rest of the year and try to stay, make sure they're not, they're not making more somehow. So that's just an extra degree of uh, complication to this that, um, you know, we weren't we were, we were trying to make this work as quickly as possible, and it seems to be kind of counter to that at this point. That's and that's I could see that really ticking some folks off here. Uh, someone said, uh, "Thanks, hey, Mel." Uh, doesn't have to be right now, but if you guys can articulate, you know, like I mentioned, I think we were anticipating, given the amount of funds that were available. Um, that the actual payments to individuals were going to be on the, the smaller end. And that's not to trivialize that every little bit helps. Um, so we were seeing the risk of exceeding average annual revenue, given what we were anticipating were the losses, um, to be minimal. But what I'm sensing from you all is that actually things are a lot closer than maybe we, we thought that they were going to be and I certainly appreciate that if there is a second pot of money, then it gets really complicated. Um, although conceivably that might not be until 2021 and maybe that gets to Steve's point. But if you all um, are thinking that there are going to be um, a substantial number of participants who are going to have the 35% loss, uh, but with the assistance that they're getting, they are going to be close to their average annual revenue, that would be helpful to know. Um, and I understand that everybody is still doing their calculations and many of you are still working on your spend plans, um, but that, that's helpful information for, for me to have. So I appreciate the feedback so far. Uh, thanks, Mel, thanks, Kelly. Dave Borden, your hand is, um, is up again. Do you have a follow-up or? Nope, it is now. No, 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 sir. Sorry about that. That's quite all right. That's quite all right. Um, I don't see any other hands um, uh, up for uh, members of the board. Uh, and I don't know if there's any other commissioners that have um, any questions for Kelly. If you do, please put them up. Um, Kelly, sounds like you do have some follow up. Um, uh, I'm assuming and hoping that you can um, follow back up with those um, directly with our executive director and then on our follow up calls. Um, with the executive committee, um, Bob can report those out. Absolutely. Great, great. Okay, 
Uh, thank you very much, Kelly, for your time. I uh, really appreciate it. Um, you, you always bring a little bit of new information to the table, and I'm sure uh, from, from the agency standpoint, you're kind of learning on the fly just as we are as we develop our spend plans. So uh, thank you for all your attention and, and being available to, uh, to the uh, commission to answer our questions. And um, please feel free to reach out to me directly or via Bob. I'm happy to do our best to answer any questions as folks are continuing to develop spend plans or as you're moving into uh, implementation and getting your applications out. So thank you for the time. Great. Thank you, Kelly. Um, I am going to move um, on I'm back on into line here on the agenda and move to item number four, which is the uh, AOC report. Um, and Spud Woodward will be giving that. Spud? Thank you, Pat. Good morning, everybody. The Administrative Oversight Committee met on July 23rd by video conference, and we had two items for consideration. The first being the proposed FY21 budget. Uh, Laura reviewed that budget for us uh, in detail. Uh, no significant deviations from previous budgets in terms of allocations by all centers. However, there is, it's worth noting that uh, we do have one significant change, and that is we are no longer servicing debt in the form of the mortgage. So that's a uh, positive step and frees up money. Uh, so the uh, committee uh, asked a few questions and in the end uh, made the motion to approve the budget uh, as presented. And so on behalf of the Administrative Oversight Committee, I recommend that the XCOM approve the proposed F1, FY21 budget. Uh, Laura's online, so if you have any questions about it, uh, she's here to take those. Great. Thank you, Spud. As a committee motion, it does not need a second. Um, is there any questions for Spud or for Laura? Um, I'm seeing, uh, let me just hit this little hand button to make sure I'm seeing it. Uh, I do have two, uh, two hands up, um, Richie White and then Malcolm Rhodes. Richie? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, <clears throat> an issue that um, uh, that I raised uh, prematurely back when I was on AOC more than 10 years ago was uh, discussion about a policy that would uh, make some kind of determination as to how much uh, excess <clears throat> revenue uh, the commission should be holding. And um, it may be more timely now that we no longer have a mortgage um, <clears throat> and that we are, um, our expenses are down with uh, not having meetings in, in person. Um, <clears throat> so I was going to make a motion at the policy board uh, to at least have AOC and executive committee to kind of look at this issue to see whether it made any sense <clears throat> um, um to come up with a policy and in talking with pat he suggested i just raise it here and we might not need a motion that uh, aoc um you know could take a look at this and and uh, see whether it does warrant uh, going forward <clears throat> uh, thanks pat yeah thank, thanks richie um based on our conversation yesterday i did follow up with bob beal uh, on this matter, and there was a there was a, a bit of that um, in a conversation that Spud maybe we were reporting out on um, regarding um, uh, state contributions, knowing that we're all going to be um, from a state perspective entering a very difficult budget climate um, based on the pandemic. Um, but but I mean, but Richie, I did get uh, information back from Bob saying that he and Laura have already had started drafting a reserve fund policy, um, and that would focus on how much the commission would hold and invest and how it can be assessed. Um, COVID has de derailed that. So if there is no objections to the, uh, to the executive committee, um, what I'd like to do is just um, have staff continue to work on that and bring it to a future executive committee meeting um, so we can continue the discussion around that. I think Richie's brought up a good issue. I mean, we're, we're we're going to be um, out from underneath our mortgage. Um, we've had a lot of savings um, by not holding some of these uh, our regular scheduled meetings. 
Um, uh, there's probably some other savings associated with travel, obviously with travel and other things as well for day-to-day um, -day business. So um, I, think, uh, I think now is a good time to have that conversation. And um, if there's no objections, we'll move it to a future executive committee meeting and have staff report out. Bob, do you want to add anything to that? No, I think it's great. You know, I, and I guess once we develop the policy, part of the questions back to the executive committee will be, you know, I hate to use the term extra money, but if there is extra money, what do you do with it? You know, the the mortgage, uh, paying off the mortgage frees up about $180,000 a year, which is a lot of money to you and me, but, you know, dividing that up among 15 states and trying to provide some assistance to the states, you know, that doesn't, doesn't do a whole lot. Um, so is it better to, you know, maybe hire a new stock assessment person with that money or a new FMP coordinator or whatever it might be, or, you know, have individual or, you know, whatever. so it gets to be a pretty complex question, but, you know, I heard be how much to sort of keep in reserve for budget shortfalls and other things at sort of you know at headquarters level um i don't i think we may have a few i don't know half a million or so in reserves right now and we've been holding on to that for a long time just just you know have it very invested in very investment uh, right now whatever the is delayed for a while or it might be we've been holding on to that money and it's just been you know it's just sitting there waiting uh you know sitting there in, a, in an account if we should ever need it for an emergency of any sort but we can flesh all that out in this policy that is 95 percent done i think laura and i can wrap it up so um nothing else to add other than that pat right Thank you. Does, um, uh, I'm going to move on. We do have a motion on the table, which is to accept the FY21 budget. Does anybody have any questions around the budget for SPUD or for Laura? Uh, and seeing no hands, uh, is there any objection to the approval of the fiscal year budget? Hearing no objections, uh, the motion passes. Um, and, I, and again, I want to thank um, staff and Laura for uh, the work on this budget. Um, I appreciate all, all, all of that work um, and uh, all of the fiduciary responsibilities that, uh, that you put in place to ensure that we keep on track. So thank you very much for that. Spud, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you, Pat. I appreciate the motion. Uh... The support from NEXCOM. The second item that the uh, AOC uh, considered was, uh, and it's somewhat related to what we've just been discussing, and that is what to do with unspent funds. And in this case, it's unspent funds associated with uh, contractual agreements, uh, spending agreements with uh, third parties. You had uh, in your briefing materials a a policy that has been drafted uh, by Laura and Bob and all to address this. Uh, it's most of us that have ever dealt with contractual work for uh, NOAA or the Fish and Wildlife Service are sort of familiar with this. Uh, it puts in writing what has really been in practice for years. So uh, um, we discussed it, uh, proposed a few minor modifications that are reflected in the version that you have for consideration, but in the end, the AOC approved this policy and recommend that it be uh, approved by the XCOM. Thank you, Spud. Um, again, it's a committee motion, does not need a second. Uh, the motion is to approve the policy, um, uh, have the XCOM uh, approve uh, the policy regarding unspent funds related to contractual agreements. Is there any questions for Spud or for staff? Seeing no hands going up, uh, is there any objections to the motion? Hearing no objections and seeing no hands uh, on the screen, uh, the motion passes without objection. Great, thank you. Um, Spud, any, any additional I, uh, information or items for the, a, for the AOC? No, sir, thank you. Uh, and that concludes the AOC report.
Great, thank you very much. Um, moving down the agenda, um, uh, item number six is to consider management and science committee recommendations regarding improvements to the advisory panel and public input process. As I said at the beginning, there are a couple, uh, or there is one agenda item or one new agenda item at the end that we might be able to fold into this conversation, which is regarding um, public hearings and how we will, we will receive public comments. Um, uh, but I know Sarah Murray uh, should be on and has a few slides that she will share with us um, on the report. So I'll turn that over to you, Sarah. Great. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and good morning, everyone. Um, yes, as mentioned, I'll be providing a brief review of the Management Science Committee's work on some of the challenges with public engagement that's including both advisory panels as well as broader public comment processes. Um, this is a task that the executive committee gave to the MSC back at the 2020 winter meeting and something we have been working on in the interim. Uh, a lot of the details are available in the memo that was available in your materials, so I won't rehash all of those for you, just going to provide some key themes and highlights um, from that work. Next slide, please. Great, so as a reminder um, from the memo, the information that we provided here in this presentation and in that memo is based on a survey that the MSC conducted of the states as well as councils and based on conversations with ISFMP staff. So when looking at the challenges faced in public engagement processes for both advisory groups and for the public comment processes, there were a few themes that overarched um, both, both types of processes. So the first challenge is that the public don't think that their input will be con considered in management. And this results in lower levels of engagement because people don't think that their input will have changes to the decisions made. They don't take the time to learn about the issues, attend hearings, provide comment, things of that nature. The second major theme is busy schedules, which I'm sure we're all familiar with. Input processes that require too much time. We have meetings that may conflict with fishing or other work, and in some cases, there are too many requests on the same individuals for states or councils. There is also a theme of special interest groups dominating the process, and this can range from the form letters that are inundating public comments to advisory groups that are no longer representative of the stakeholders. Finally, there are challenges with public that were not informed on the issues being discussed or on the management processes, which prevented people from providing substantive input. Next slide, please. All right, so we'll view some of the highlights from for strategies that the MSC developed for dealing with some of these challenges, first focusing on advisory panels, advisory groups. So when it comes to developing solutions for advisory panels, one of the key questions is how big of a change would you like to make? So there are some smaller changes that could be made, tweaks to the existing process, for example, providing meals or stipends to encourage participa participation, all the way up to a complete overall overhaul of the AP process, such as restructuring or consolidating the APs. So the next steps on this are really going to de depend on preferences to the extent of changes and whether we want to stick closer to the existing process or if we're interested in exploring some broader changes. Next slide. When it comes to public comment, one of the key things to keep in mind is that solutions here will really require a multi-pronged approach. We're not going to be able to do one thing and have that solve all, all of the problems with public comment. And this is because there are so many diverse stakeholders. So I think it's easy to see, for example, if we 
moved to only providing information about public input processes via social media that might help with a younger demographic, but it's going to leave a lot of the older demographic out of the conversation. So you need to have multiple strategies for reaching the different groups more effectively. That said, um, a lot of states have had and councils have had success with posting a video of the presentations online and providing online surveys. Obviously, given our current situation, this has even more appeal as it's a way to get public comment without having in-person meetings, which aren't really feasible at the moment. But even in the long term, this helps to address a number of different challenges that we're facing, whether it's time constraints, but also things like public comment being dominated by certain people at hearings because it's less time consuming and because there's less pressure on presentation, we might be able to get a broader range of input there. If we want to pursue this approach, we'd also recommend potentially looping in the Committee on Economics and Social Sciences to provide some guidance on how to effectively produce surveys so that we're making sure we're getting the input that we need and that we're not biasing it by how we're framing the questions. The second piece for public comment is to explore some strategies for more effectively reaching stakeholders. We highlighted some of these in the memo, but this is another case that it would be helpful to reach out and, and potentially task the Committee on Economics and Social Sciences with exploring some of these strategies further. A lot of them are already working with stakeholders in this way or doing surveys of fishermen are working with sea grant and things of that nature so they could have some expertise that would be helpful in in brainstorming for their ideas in addition to the ideas that were provided through the survey of states and councils the third piece uh, is considering developing a commission policy on dealing with form letters uh, this is a significant issue in the public comment process, for example, for this week's Menhaden board, we received 700 pages of input, much of it in the form of form letters. And so this is something to consider, but in order to move forward, we would need some guidance um, on how exactly you would like to deal with um, form letters, because this is really going to come down to a judgment call rather than a, a technical determination. So that is something that we could pursue and, and further develop if that is of interest. Next slide, please. Okay, so this is an overarching theme from advisory panels as well as public comment. And this is addressing the challenge of the public not thinking that their input is going to be taken into account. A strategy that was identified was essentially encouraging increased engagement between commissioners and the public, especially advisory panel members. For example, this could be talking to AP members about decisions that were made and why they might be different than their input. This could increase engagement and increase the sense that their, their input is actually being considered. While there are some other strategies that were proposed, such as communications materials to better explain board actions, there were concerns about the effectiveness. For example, developing further communication materials would put the burden on staff for explaining reasoning behind decisions. And in some cases, the reasoning may not always be clear or be a result of, for example, meeting in the middle between many different views. So it may not be as clear cut um, and, and simple to provide a, a document explaining why decisions are different from public input. Next slide. The last overarching theme is related to communications and education. With both the advisory panels and public comment, there were issues with public that was uninformed on either management processes or on the issues being discussed. To tackle the issue of public that's not 
fully informed on management processes. The MSC proposed developing additional educational materials, such as short videos on the management process. The second piece is lack of understanding about the issue being discussed. And for this challenge, a potential solution would be to simplify management documents to make them more accessible to the public. Next slide. All right, so that leads us to potential next steps. Before pre proceeding further, we wanted to get some guidance on which strategies we actually wanted to pursue. Some of the strategies could be implemented right now, while others may require further development. If further development is needed on, on the strategies chosen, then the MSC and or the SES could be tasked with that work. And with that, I'd be happy to take any questions. Uh, great, thank you, Sarah. Um, oops, I have lost my screen, there it is. Do we have any questions from the executive committee? Jim Gilmore. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and Sarah, that's a great presentation. Just a couple of questions on the slide, if you could go back to the, um, the surveys. Um, there was two questions I had on that. Um, uh, keep going. Uh, that was it. I think you just went past it. So um, first off, um, the um, yeah, I think one of the things that's been helpful is that the um, you know the face-to-face -face meetings we've seen uh, and and most recently with our strike pass hearings last fall was that they can uh, organizations can stack the room and give us a false sense. So we did a survey um, and we actually got very different. Um, conclusions based upon the survey, which we thought was more objective. However, we thought we were being kind of crafty in that we said um, you can only put in one comment and you, so we essentially were looking at, you know, you only buy, you can only uh, get one comment per email. And now we find out organizations have multiple emails. So um, there's ways to game that. So uh, one question was that is um, we don't, we're not very sophisticated on the, um, on the electronic side of this or the media side, is this something maybe, um, and this is back to maybe the, 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 the committee, is that maybe ACCSP could provide some guidance on how we can do these things so uh, they can re reduce the gaming part of it because uh, I think the surveys make a good tool, but we want to make sure they're not being um, skewed one way or another. So that was question one. And then number two, um, just, um, the last bullet um, I, I saw from my last um, set of information on Menhaden that Pew had gotten a letter out and it was a form letter, but on top of it, they did get individual comments, but there's comments coming from places like Illinois and Arizona and Iowa, which um, I'm not sure how really concerned they are about um, Menhaden. So, um, not only the form letters, but but if we start getting into those types of comments that are coming back, we add that to the policy. Is that some weighting as to um, you know comments that we're getting from coastal communities that are really impacted by um, the fishery management plan versus people that are well, I think it's called intrinsic value that they know that they really want to have uh, you know. Um, jellyfish in the middle of the ocean, but it's just really something they see on the Discovery Channel, you get a lot less waiting. So just uh, if you can factor, you know, that into our, you know, that part of this, I think would be helpful. Thanks. Yeah, great. Two good points that I will make note of. Great. Thank you, Jim. Jason McMahon. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Sarah, great job. Uh, thanks for that. Um, I think these are comments. Um, so the, the first one, I'm really interested in uh, the idea of stipends. And, you know, I, as you were talking about that and reading about that a little bit, I'm um, thinking about the regional councils a little bit, at least the New England Council, um, the committees, which I think are somewhat analogous to you know, at least in part to the what we're trying to do with the advisory panels. I'm pretty sure they do stipends and they have really good participation. Um, so I'm, I'm thinking that might be probably this, the single most effective way to get more participation if if that's what we want. But, you know, obviously that 
costs money. Um, so I think the way to approach it would be to do some trade-off analysis and it sounds fancy, but all, all I'm really talking about is, you know, um, kind of project how many APs meet in a year and how many people are on those APs and some different um, ideas on what the stipend amount could be. And then look at that, okay, if we are gonna spend that amount of money, what would we need to drop? Would we have to lose like uh, a survey that's being funded by the ASMFC or, and I'm just making stuff up, but, or do we need to do one of the in-person commission meeting weeks virtually a year to compensate? So just kind of thinking about it and then looking at, you know, some trade-offs that would be involved in, in um, kind of pulling something like that off. Um, and to go along with that, if we were to start giving AP member stipends, I think we'd want to think about the accountability. So, you know, certainly get a lot more strict with attendance and, and kick people off if they miss like two meetings or something like that. And there may be some other things. So I think there's some ideas to explore there um, on the stipend idea. Uh, and then the other comment I'll make is, you know, in the short term, I think, I hope that someday we can get back to in-person uh, meetings. I, I desperately hope that. <laughs> um, but, you know, I think, you know, simulcasting a live meeting with a, a virtual option in the short term might be um, effective at, you know, at least you've given people options, you know, if they can't travel or, um, or whatever, that might help enhance participation a, a little bit more than what we're getting now. So thanks for that. Just wanted to make those happy if you wanted to react to anything, uh, Sarah or Mr. Chair, but um, just wanted to make those comments. No, uh, thank you, Jason. Do you have any, we want to follow up on any of that, Sarah? Nope, just taking notes on that good point about um, trade-off analyses for stipends. Great. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Jason. Uh, I have Roy Miller. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, may I offer just a little follow-up to Jay's comments? Yeah, please. Uh, Jay, I appreciate your ideas, but uh, I would just point out concerning stipends that uh, I should I should remind everyone that administrative and uh, regular commissioners on the commission who are not um, still employed by state agencies or federal agencies don't receive any stipends either for ASMSC participation. Um, so having stipends for advisory panels would be something new and um, uh, well, I'm not sure how how to how to phrase this, but basically why should advisory panel members get a stipend when commission members don't get a stipend? Do you see where I'm going with that? Thank you. Yeah, thanks for that comment, Roy. Um, I'm gonna go down the list. I've got Dennis Abbott next. Yes, thank you. Appreciating Jay's remarks, but I feel much the same as Roy Miller. There are different categories of folks who serve as commissioners. And I'll use one as an example, Steve Train from Maine. When he comes to commission meetings, he does not receive a stipend, but he leaves his lobstering business behind, which is a great strain for him, especially in, the, in this time. Also someone like myself, who's devoted 23 plus years to this without a stipend or whatever you wanna call it, it would create a terribly unfair situation to also folks like Roy Miller. And there is a difference between some of the folks that come who are staff members for legislators who are on a payroll or whatever, but those of us who strictly volunteer to do this, I would have great angst if that was, we were to start paying essentially advisors, thanks. 
Thanks, Ennis. Uh, Dan McKernan. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I like Jay's suggestions about simulcasting hearings to enhance participation, and maybe the legacy of this pandemic will be to kind of create uh, that option going forward. Um, I think uh, for a lot of folks traveling, you know, one to two hours, especially around trying to get through Boston, uh, and, and that traffic uh, does discourage participation in some of our hearings. So having said that, uh, I, I just want to remind everyone about the, the advisory panels and sort of the my, my view of the influence of advisory panels has always kind of struck me as, as um, a little um, curious because back in Massachusetts, we have a nine member Marine Fisheries Advisory Commission that is tasked to oversee the the agency's rulemaking about the times, places, and amounts of fish that may be taken. And we seek a lot of advice from them about uh, uh, you know, rulemaking and positions that we can take, how we would counter the, in, uh, the, the, uh, the uh, import of an advisory panel compared to my nine member governor's appointed Marine Fisheries Advisory Commission uh, creates a challenge. For us, obviously, we listen closely to the nine-member panel that we work with monthly. So um, I'm not sure you can solve the the advisory panel's uh, you know lack of of inf uh, or sufficient influence on the outcome of a, a rulemaking, but there are more complex uh, uh, factors in play when it comes to marine fisheries policy. Great, thanks. Thank you, Dan. Any other, I don't see any other hands. Anybody else have any additional comments or questions for Sarah on this topic? This is John Clark. I, I'm on the phone only. Can you hear me? I can hear you, John. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, I was just, um, um, as far as the uh, advisory panels go, uh, Sarah, was some of these strategies, could they be put in the category of lowering expectations? Because following up on what, uh, Dan said there that we have the same situation where we have our own in-state advisors that talk to us about items. And um, I think one of the uh, things I hear about people that have been on advisory panels is they come in with a set goal of what they want to see happen. And when that doesn't happen, the response is nobody listens to us. And, you know, I'm just wondering if uh, we could make a maybe a bold disclaimer for anybody joining an advisory panel that, you know, emphasize the advisory part and that just because we don't make a decision that follows in what they want does not mean we haven't heard their input, but there are so many other factors to consider. Thanks, uh, thanks, John. Sarah, do you have a follow up? Sure, yeah, and I think two things. First, um, the overlap and with different state advisory groups is something that was discussed and one of the potential strategies that we thought of was trying to find better ways to collaborate with those groups and not have as much redundancy um, and so that could be something that we could look further into we don't have a specific mock-up of of what that would look like but it could be something that we would look at. And then when it comes to lowering expectations, I think that was a piece of the educational component that we were discussing when it comes to management processes and trying to do a better job of explaining what the AP role is, how the management process works, how their input may be included, but also how, um, you know, there are a lot of factors and their input isn't the only factor in making these decisions. So I think that was meant to be a part of the educational component as well. Thank you, Sarah. And I just would like to add that, uh, We've seen in Delaware that even some commissioners who figured once they got on at the commission level, they could really change things, realize that as just one person on the state delegation and in the commission, a lot of times decisions don't go your way. So it's good to get that out there that, you know, there's a lot that goes into these decisions. 
Great. I don't see any more hands on this. Um, Sarah, I really appreciate uh, this presentation. It's um, certainly been, it's, it's very thorough. I think it gives the executive committee a lot to think about. Um, I think because of the time limitation that we have here, um, what I'd like to do um, uh, with with the approval of the um, with the approval of the executive committee is come back to this at a future meeting to see if we need to have um, uh, the science and management committee do some um, digging in a more focused more, more focused areas some of the points that have been brought up here um, would there be any objections to that hearing no objections then we will continue on uh, with the agenda thank you sarah for that report um let's see where are we on the agenda um item number seven is an update on the on pennsylvania's participation on the atlantic menhaden board and i'll turn that over to bob beal he's on mute What have we done with Bob today? We've silenced him. I, I keep getting muted by the organizer, so uh, I don't know what that means. I'm taking it personally, though. I can tell you that. Um, well, no, just kidding. Um, our appraisal review is in a little bit here, so um, maybe <laughs> some reflection there. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, thanks, Pat. You know, I think just just sort of uh, as an update on this issue. The two letters that were circulated, I think, went out to the entire executive committee, and we can share them with other commissioners if they're interested. Um, the first letter was from the commission's attorney, Sean Donahue, and it just spelled out some concerns that he has um, with Pennsylvania participating on the Atlantic Menhaden Board. Um, if you go into the rules and regulations and the compact and some of the other guiding documents of the commission, there are some comments about uh, Pennsylvania and Vermont actually participating on the uh, on individual issues, species issues at the commission, and uh, they should be limited to diadromous species only. Um, and uh, Sean Donahue has expressed some concern that you know if down the road you know anyone wanted to challenge Menhaden's participation in the uh, Menhaden board. There, um, you know, there, the commission may be exposed to a little bit of liability there. You know, he said it's kind of not worth falling on your sword over this one, but you know, down the road, it, it is probably worth something considering. Um, you know, we want to limit our liability. You know, there have been Pennsylvania has participated in the Menhaden board for five years or so. Um, there have not been many close votes. I don't think Pennsylvania has initiated motions on anything that um has changed any any outcomes at the menhaden board meeting but um you know it's sort of a perception issue as much as anything else um, pennsylvania responded to sean donahue's original memo and described their position that they would like to continue participating on the menhaden board and they felt that you know they were justified and, and they were an active and important part of the uh, menhaden management process um right now where we are is sean donahue is <clears throat> drafting a response to Pennsylvania's response um, and Sean asked me to dig into some of the background documents and previous editions of rules and regulations and that sort of thing at the commission to sort of uh, evaluate the evolution of those changes over time and uh, that's what we're doing now I need to get Sean a couple documents and then he can produce um, you know his final perspective but you know talking with Sean he, he generally said you know Pennsylvania's response is good but it, it he didn't feel like it changed his perspective that it may be better to remove Pennsylvania from the species management board. Obviously they should and can participate at the policy board and the full commission meetings. And, um, you know, if there's any amendments or other documents that go to the full commission for approval, um, Pennsylvania can comment on those documents at that point. So it's, it's sort of a, you know, work in progress right now between uh, multiple attorneys and it, it, it uh, is something that a decision will have to be made moving forward. And, you know, as we're going to hear at the Pen at the Menhaden board later today, you know, obviously ERPs are the, the issue of the day, but after that, what happens? Are we about to initiate a new amendment process or a new management action of some sort? And then, so it may be, 
worthwhile to consider this issue prior to getting too deep into the next management action at the at the Menhaden board. So that's the update. I'm happy to answer any questions. And if anyone else wants some of the background documents that are not on the executive committee, let me know and I can send them your way. Uh, great. Thank you, Bob, for the update. Um, I see we've got one hand up. Um, Chris Kuhn. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, for the opportunity to, I'd like to briefly speak to Pennsylvania's participation in the Manhattan Board, if I can have about two minutes. Yeah, absolutely, Chris, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So Pennsylvania Fish and Boat Commission's letter dated June 15, 2020, in response to the legal document memo from ASMSC suggesting that Pennsylvania would draw from the Manhattan Board clearly communicates Pennsylvania's position on this matter, as has Andy Shields, who preceded me on this committee when this issue first arise, or rose rather. Um, in the interest of timeliness, I won't repeat the entirety of Pennsylvania's position on this matter, but feel the need to restate highlights here this morning. Uh, number one, Pennsylvania joined the Menhaden Board in 2016, as, as Bob Beale had mentioned, after successfully demonstrating an interest in the fishery and being unanimously approved by the policy board. During this time, the Menhaden Board, Pennsylvania consistently advocated for best management practices, conservation related goals, and equitable allotment of Menhaden quota. And three, additionally, during this time, the, uh, there have been no instances or complaints that Pennsylvania has failed to support equitable allocation of the resources ecological and economic benefits among user groups. So I'll leave you with one last thought. Pennsylvania continues to question, I guess, why it's being asked by ASMSC to withdraw from the Menhaden Board at this time, given the reasons I detailed in the letter and, and, and those that I highlighted here this morning. In addition to the fact that Pennsylvania legitimately demonstrated an interest in the fishery, was unanimously approved by the policy board, has participated on the board with conservation-minded principles, and has not been found out of compliance at any time as a member. We would assert now more than ever that Pennsylvania continue to be represented on the Menhaden board given the ERP considerations, Menhaden's strong connection to Atlantic striped bass, and the current status of the striped bass stock. For these reasons and, and, and others, uh, Pennsylvania intends to continue to serve as a member of the Menhaden Board to advocate for conservation and equitable management in the spirit of the compact and the FMP. Thank you. Hey, thank, Chris, thank you for those comments. Um, we have two other hands that have gone up, uh, Lauren Lustig and Dennis Abbott. Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I I want to uh, document that I agree entirely with what uh, we just heard from Chris Kuhn. Uh, I view our participation, Pennsylvania's participation in the Menhaden Board as uh, extremely important. Uh, I would remind the uh, commissioners that uh, Leroy Young did a, a very thorough documentation of uh, historic presence of Menhaden in Pennsylvania waters of the Delaware Bay and uh, was able to document uh, their presence uh, both in historic times and in recent times. Uh, so uh, I would uh, be, very, be uh, really disappointed uh, if uh, we were um, unnecessarily uh, removed from that board. Thank you. Thank you, Lauren. Uh, Dennis Abbott. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate the comments from Chris Kuhn and also Mr. Lustig. However, I think that we have to abide by the laws. I find that the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania's thoughts, positions align very closely with the positions that my state takes and many other state takes. But I don't think that that's the issue of whether what side of any issues they're on, are we in compliance with our laws and rules? If we don't stand behind our laws and rules, we're not doing what I would consider the right thing. If it's proven that 
we probably made a mistake five years ago. I don't think that the issues that have been brought up by our attorney were brought up probably at that time. I don't recall. But anyway, I think it's most, most important that regardless of where you stand on this issue regarding Pennsylvania, that we have to stand behind our compact and our rules and regulations. Thank you, uh, thank you Dennis. Um, uh, Chris Kuhn, did you want to follow up? I saw your hand, your hand is still up or did you just not take it down? Uh, I thought I took it down. I had no follow up. Okay, thank you. Now, now. I, I have a lot of hands that have gone back uh, have, that are up now. Uh, I'm going to go um, uh, Roy Miller, Bill Anderson, and Steve Bowman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm I'm wondering, Chris, does Pennsylvania um, need a quota for Atlantic Menhaden? Uh, if, if Pennsylvania didn't receive a quota for Atlantic Menhaden, and uh, could that be split up among other members of the uh, Menhaden uh, states? And you see where I'm going with this? I mean, could a compromise satisfy everyone's needs here? In other words, keep Pennsylvania as a voting member of the board but they wouldn't receive a quota uh, of Menhaden unless they can demonstrate that a fishery develops or there was a historical fishery within the Pennsylvania borders. Thank you. Chris, did you want, you want to address that question? Yes, uh, thank you for those comments. Um, that's something that certainly has been 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 discussed in in, in terms of of Pennsylvania's quota. Uh, the stance that we have taken as a state in the past is that we do have a historic fishery. Uh, there is documentation that Menhaden do occur in the in the Pennsylvania waters of the Delaware estuary, and we have chosen not to execute that fishery, uh, prosecute that fishery in 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 Pennsylvania waters, but rather leave that quota of Menhaden in the water for the ecological purposes and conservation purposes that they provide for other fisheries. Uh, thank you, Chris. Um, Bill Anderson. Pat, thank you. I want to uh, kind of lend support to the comment, the, the comment before last, in that um, I, I would be very surprised if anybody uh, on the executive board here was questioning Pennsylvania's commitment, participation, uh, the information they're providing, uh, saying that it's not valuable because I don't think that's the case at all. But I think that this boils down to um, laws and policies and procedures. And you know, we hire, we hire and engage a lawyer to give us advice. Uh, that lawyer has given us advice, suggested um, that you know. With all great intention, a mistake may have been made previously about uh, allowing participation on the board, but I think we got to follow the rules um, as they're laid out and as are being advised to us by our legal counsel. Um, in this particular case, it, it's it's um, it, it would be against Pennsylvania, but in the next particular case, it may be against somebody else's state. And um, I think there needs to be consistency based on. Um, the rules that we're asked to, to operate or, or we've agreed to operate under. I, I think that is as simple as that. And it's not a particular attack on any state or, or, or on their commitment. It's, it's far from being that. Uh, thank you, Bill, for those comments. Uh, Tom Foley. Thank you, Chairman, for allowing me to talk on this issue. Um, Pennsylvania, when we allowed uh, New Hampshire and Maine to come in on black sea bass, they didn't have a quota. They actually weren't harvested. We saw fish appearing in their state and figured they should be on the board if they wanted to be on the board. Also, when we started to look at Menhaden and its contribution to striped bass, and even though it's right now not an amendment, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and uh, and uh, Delaware consider producing areas because that's where the fish basically spawn. So we, their responsibility is also to protect striped bass that are basically Menhaden are an important part of that. 
looking at that as we're going forward, just as we've heard yesterday. So I have concerns about asking them to leave. I mean, we made a, I, I think, good faith decision. I mean, I don't know what the criteria is. Do we use different criteria? I mean, if Maine doesn't have a quota and they're not fishing on black sea bears, are they still allowed to sit on the black sea board, board? or so is New Hampshire? Even though they, they didn't want to participate, that was up to them. But they could if they wanted to. So are we going to set up different criteria for different states? Thank you. There's an opportunity to talk. Thank you for that input, Tom. Um, uh, Lauren, I see your hand is still up. Did you have a follow-up? Lauren's hand is now down. Steve Bowman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd just like to echo the comments of uh, Mr. Anderson and uh, Mr. Abbott. You know, hadn't been in the not too uh, distant past that we had a significant debate on the adherence to the rules and regulations. We have legal guidance uh, from our attorney, and I think we should heed both the guidance and the necessity to uphold uh, the integrity of the commission by maintaining uh, adherence to the to the rules and regulations that we have. I think I may have been around five years ago. I'm not sure when we passed it. Uh, and I think sometimes when we make decisions, we make the decisions uh, in good faith. But sometimes good faith decisions, uh, after a thorough examination, turn out to be the wrong decision. And I think it shows uh, a significant character that when we determine that we made a decision that may be wrong, we need to rectify that decision. So. That's my position. And then absolutely no deference. And I mean it to my friends in Pennsylvania. I just think this is uh, a policy issue and we should uh, adhere to the guidance of both our legal counsel and the rules of the uh, of the compact. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Um, Chris Kuhn, I'm going to give you the last word on this matter. Yes, yeah, so I just as a, as a as a follow up to some of the discussion, I appreciate the comments and, and from from those that, that that made them. I would just I would just like like to hope that uh, Sean would review all states membership on all boards uh, if we're going down this road with Pennsylvania on the Menhaden board. Uh, thank you for that, Chris. Um, um, as as Bob said at the beginning, um, we are going back uh, based on Pennsylvania's response, and Sean has asked uh, Bob for some additional information. Um, a letter has not been finalized yet. Um, I would suggest we table this discussion till the letter has been finalized um, and then bring this back to the executive committee. Um, if there is no objections, um, we'll move forward in that direction. And I'm seeing, seeing and hearing no objections. So I want to thank you very much for the conversation around uh, around this. Um, I, I, I want to just make sure that I echo the fact that I, I want to be clear that this is not questioning the commitments around Pennsylvania. And I think we need to, um, I, I don't think we need to do it. I think everybody is doing that. I don't think anybody is um, questioning Pennsylvania's commitments. It's about process and if we have to address it, can it be addressed in policy or is it a law change? And I think those two questions need to be answered um, when uh, when the executive director comes back with the input from the attorney. So with that, uh, I'm going to uh, move on to the next agenda item. Actually, Roy Miller, you had your hand, your hand she's showing up. Did you have a comment? No, I'm sorry. Nope, nope, that's fine. Um, okay, going down the agenda, uh, um, uh, item number eight um, is consider dividing the South Atlantic and the state federal management board into two management boards. Um, Bob, uh, you're listed on this. I know Tony's been working on it. Um, I would ask staff to, to try to be quick on this. And if we need to follow up at a future meeting, let's do that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I'm unmuted, so that's good. Um, I think we may want to just go ahead and postpone this one, Pat. You know, the, the overarching issue is there's multiple species in the South Atlantic board. Cobia has been added. The membership or those species are scattering up and down the coast a little bit differently than they have in the past. So membership is 
um, expanding uh, for some states. And it may make some sense to set up a board, sort of what we're calling coastal pelagics, which is uh, maybe cobia and Spanish mackerel, and then put the other ones, the cyanids, essentially, and keep them with the cyanid board or South Atlantic board or whatever we may call it. And it's going to hopefully just sort of spread the workload out a little bit. It'll help us at staff to bite up some of the, the staff burden and those sorts of things. But None of this is urgent. If you want to uh, take this up at a later meeting, if you're if you're concerned about time, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, I, we do have just a couple minutes on this, and we've got one more thing that I need to reference um, before we go into the closed session. Um, any objections to pushing this off to a later call? hearing and seeing no hands hearing no objections yeah let's do that let's table this conversation uh for one of our later calls bob sounds good okay thank you um before we break for the closed session uh just going to get back up to my notes here um, um a couple things very quickly um, um tom Foley did submit a letter in regards to working groups um, I know within that letter, um, Tom, I, I had a very good conversation with Tom. Tom was not uh, at all um, uh, unaware um, of Richie White's surgery, um, as I think it's all it's public now, but Richie White had some had a serious uh, heart operation. Uh, and uh, as you heard him on the phone today, is doing very well. Uh, and we're all incredibly happy for that. Um, I think the, the overarching issue, though, in Tom Fody's letter is um, is around the work group and the policies that we have for work groups. So certainly, this working group on striped bass uh, prevented, presented to the striped bass board a very thorough document and what I considered to be a very balanced document. And I don't think that was being questioned. It, it, it was the fact that participation was being questioned. What I, what I don't want to do on this call is get into the details of the letter, but to raise it, to recognize that it was received, and then to advance this topic um, to one of our next calls coming right up um, to be sure that it is uh, it, the idea of the makeup of working committee, working groups uh, is discussed uh, by the executive committee and if needed by the policy board. So if there is no objections to moving that conversation uh, to uh, a future meeting, um, that will be the plan. Hearing no objections and seeing no hand raised, um, I'll go to the last item, which is uh, the, the annual meeting. Um, annual meeting is three months away. Um, uh, New Jersey, uh, along with staff, have done a tremendous job getting ready for that event. Um, but we are also in a period where we are um, in a state of uncertainty because of COVID-19, the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, Bob and Spud and I have discussed, uh, discussed this, and um, we believe that we should just plan on a virtual annual meeting um, for October. And um, we can have a quick discussion on this point now. Um, if, if you'd like, or we can, if everybody's in agreement with, with that decision, uh, and if not, we can move that conversation to a future call as well. Uh, Joe Semino has his hand up. Joe? <clears throat> Thanks, Mr. Chair. I, I unfortunately think I have to agree with you since, you know, the number of cases in many of our states uh, isn't looking great. Um, and, you know, we're still looking at very serious travel policy restrictions. All southern states right now um, would have to quarantine for two weeks before, <laughs> if we're still in the same situation before the annual meeting. Um, the one thing I had discussed with Laura, and I, I would like, you know, maybe some consideration from the executive board, is it, it really meant a lot to us to host, and our hope would be that we could host it in 2021 if this one is virtual. Just wanted to add that. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thanks, Joe. Um, I, I certainly would be in favor of just shifting everybody a year, but um, we certainly can add that uh, to the conversation. Um, I see Tom Foley's hand up. Uh, since you're from Jersey, Tom, I'd like to hear your thoughts around that as well. Every meeting, this is Tom Foley again, uh, every meeting we've had in New Jersey has been postponed. A lot of the companies have decided they're not meeting till next March, having in-person meetings. Uh, the governor is now, because of 
an increase of transmission has decided yesterday that he's cutting down the amount of people in public spaces and inside spaces. So I don't know if we could fit that criteria. And again, with the flu season coming up with this combined, I can basically almost guarantee we're going to be shut down and not able. I've canceled a whole bunch of things, including the annual dinner we have. And that was for November because we knew it wasn't going to even happen then because most of the uh, holes are basically telling us that. And that was actually the casino saying we're not going to be able to do that in November. So I don't hold that much promise. So instead of hanging on and basically putting everybody, well, we're going to do it or we're not going to do it, I'd sooner do, do what Joe suggested and, and really host it for next year. I had a lot of plans going on. I'd done a lot of things in preparation, but it will just give us a head start of next year. Thank you very much. Thank, thanks, Tom. Um, there's no other hands up at this point. Um, what I would, um, I'd like to just put this on the table. Um, if there's disagreement, we can, or we need, we need further discussion, we can. But I, at this point in time, I'd like to say that the annual meeting for 2020 has been postponed and the annual meeting that will be held and that was to be held in New Jersey would be pushed to 2021. Is there any objections or do we need more discussion on the second part of that? Seeing no objection, hearing no objection, seeing no hands going up, um, um, I guess we'll have Laura in New Jersey continue to make the plans for 2021 around, uh, around that destination. So thank you for that. And that, uh, oh, Jim Gilmore put his hands up. Last word, Jim. Just a quick question for the annual meeting. Yeah, and I agree uh, with travel restrictions, but um, we've been doing some meetings and a suggestion would be is, is would it be possible to add a video to the virtual meeting and then have maybe the three commissioners um, be in one place uh, and it may make the meetings go a little bit better because I've been noticing it's you know with that amount of commissioners spread out over so many telephone lines whatever it's a little bit more difficult to communicate so a suggestion uh, maybe consider that for the annual meeting and I uh, I have a conference room where in New York where we can socially distance and all be on one video um, and maybe that'll make it work a little bit better. Uh, so anyway, Flora, Bob, and you wanna talk about that, I think that may help improve these. Thanks. Thanks, Jim. We, we've actually talked about doing that up here for, for non-commission meetings. Um, so why don't we have staff kind of ponder that, whether logistically through WebEx that is possible and then we'll discuss that at the, uh, at the next executive committee call. Um, with that, I'm going to move to, um, is, there, is there any other business for the executive committee before we go into closed session? Seeing no hands and hearing no voices jump up. Um, so at this point in time, we have, uh, make sure I didn't miss anything here on my agenda. At this point in time, item number 10 is to discuss the executive director's annual performance review. This is a closed, closed session. Um, all members of the executive committee have been sent a separate link. Uh, that link, um, as soon as we would ask that you hang up from this one and then we'll call in on the next, on, on the link that was sent around. The